Uh, my story starts long ago in a land far, far away called Boston. Uh, I was on a team. We built an electric motorcycle, and we raced from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, over to uh, up to Canada, over to Michigan, down through Michigan, all the way to Texas, then along the southern border, and we came up into Pasadena, California. And we did this in one week. And in 1970, that was called the Clean Air Car Race. Uh, 1970 was the Clean Air Act. 1970 was the first Earth Day. 1972, I don't want to fall over here, was the Clean Water Act, and marijuana was only $10 a lid. <laughs> For the environmental movement, these were great times. Um, so it was that race that made me feel that a uh, fun, efficient electric car could be built. And that is my quest. And so I built the Flying Pig. Uh, now, for this talk to really make any more sense, and it may not anyway, but to give it that shot, uh, you have to understand the niche, and especially the EV niche, uh, which is, for electric vehicles, they take their short trip daytime driving. Most of the trips today, for those of you that don't use mass transit, most of your trips today are short mileage trips, uh, creating a lot of the urban air pollution. Replacing these short mileage trips with the EVs, the electric vehicles, will take care of these pollution problems, and that's the first part of the niche. So we're placing the IC trips, the internal combustion engines, with the EV tricks, trips, the electric vehicle trips. So that's the first half of the niche. The other half of the niche is to uh, charge at night when excess electrical power is together. So that's the entire package. We've been doing this for a long time. It's short daytime trips, nighttime charging, and that's the niche, and that fits. OK, so for the next project here, uh, Driving electric vehicles. Driving electric vehicles is pretty much very similar to driving regular internal combustion vehicles. You have your battery charge state meter. You have your odometer. You check your mileage. You check your battery charge state meter. The, import, the important fact being is that when you get to the halfway point in the power meter, it's time to start heading home. <laughs> now, very, very soon, you have to drive these for a while. You learn what uh, routes you can take, your usual errands, and like that. And it all falls into place really pretty easily. Uh, the, um, and if you do make a mistake, there are always your friends at AAA, and they've helped me out more than once. Okay, so the uh, first mass-produced electric vehicle by General Motors, very popular, was the EV1. Uh, the EV1 had a stated range of 45 to 90 miles, and it used uh, lead-acid gel cell batteries. My pig uses a similar battery. Uh, the lack, the advertising and promotion of the EV1 by General Motors was somewhat, shall we say, lackluster. And when the law was specifically changed that no longer required automobile manufacturers to create zero emission vehicles if they wished to sell cars in California, once that law was changed, adios EV1. That project was ended. So a few years go by and we get into our next set of electric vehicles. The first one again, General Motors, the Volt, great electric car. The next one, the Nissan Leaf. And the third one, uh, by, IE, by uh, LI Motors, the winner of the X-Price competition, the Wave 2. Very nice electric cars. Now, these electric cars chose the uh, lithium-ion battery, very popular these days. Uh, excellent energy-to-weight ratio, but they're pretty costly. They require uh, complex management systems to distribute charge power across the pack to remove drive energy from the pack, and also to maintain a constant temperature across the pack. Uh, a couple years ago, when I was pricing them to put them in the pig, they were about $1,000 a kilowatt hour. So I didn't put them in the pig. Uh, $1,000 a kilowatt hour. Now, um, uh, the specs, here we go. So if we look at the specs here for these electric cars, you can see the size of the power packs for each of the electric vehicles. A good electric car uses much less than a half a kilowatt hour per mile. So if you look at these, uh, the specs on these cars, you can see they all fill the niche. They all will take care of those short mileage trips, uh, no problem. We'll throw the pig up there, too. So um, now they filled the niche. I thought, geez, finally we've won. The electric cars are going to take over now. We fit the niche. Everything's good. But I'm afraid that some of the EV industry and speakers are kind of getting off track these days. And I have some concerns I want to express today. My first concern that I hear a lot about is uh, charge stations. Uh, everyone is talking about charge stations, how desperately we need them. But if you look at the specs here on the uh, sheet, 
But short mileage trips can already be done by electric vehicles. Remember the niche, you're gonna drive short mileages during the day, you're gonna charge at night when excess electrical power is available. But now as everybody's talking about charge stations and it's become so political, I'm very, very sure we'll have charge stations everywhere. Now a bigger point is you can put charge stations anywhere you want, but excess electrical power must be available. In many cities across the US on typical business days, excess power is quite, a bit, is quite unlikely. So why do they make this up, this requirement uh, for the charge stations? I don't quite know why. But as soon as they get more and more evolved, we'll find out if that will work or not. Uh, my next point here is the uh, charging at night. When I charge the pig at night, it draws uh, 12 amps of power. Uh, 12 amps of power means I can plug into any outlet anywhere, which is really pretty handy because if you look around the neighborhood, a lot of neighbors' houses have outdoor outlets. <laughs> It's pretty easy to snake an extension cord over the fence and plug in. Nobody ever notices. Nothing will reduce your operating costs more than this fact. <laughs> now, my next concern about the um, electric vehicles is the cost. Uh, in March, I drove a General Motors Volt. Great little electric car, got back to the showroom. The salesman said, well, for $50,000, we'll put you in this car right now. I said, $50,000? He said, well, the... The cheap model is 41, but we won't have any of those. All they got is the $50,000 model. So this might be the thought process for somebody um, wanting to purchase an electric vehicle. See, so you have $40,000 for an electric vehicle, $20,000 for a good internal combustion vehicle, an IC. So that would give me $20,000 for gas, for a fuel cost, the offset. So uh, $20,000. $5 a gallon for gas, 4,000 gallons, uh, 30 miles to a gallon. So basically, I can go 120,000 miles of driving in that cost difference. So I'd love to drive an electric car and buy one, but right now, I just can't afford to. Uh, my next, <clears throat> but wait, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking, but Charles, there's benevolent rich people that'll help you buy these cars. If you purchase an electric vehicle, you get credit of $7,500 or more per vehicle you purchase. If you purchase an electric vehicle for commercial use in the state of California, the rebates range from $5,000 to $20,000 per vehicle. Now this, all, now this all sounds great, but some of you may recognize these benevolent rich people as taxpayers. And you gotta love them, taxpayers, because really they have the money. Now, taxpayers really cannot subsidize these purchases. Simple electric vehicles, well-designed, will stand on their own. And subsidizing the purchases of electric vehicles is certainly not going to encourage uh, efficient manufacturing. Uh, why would it? Uh, my next big concern is the uh, IC design. Uh, one of the great things about electric vehicles is you can get away from the traditional drive systems that are used by internal combustion vehicles. No more transmissions, no more differentials. You can have an independent motor drive each, for each drive wheel. Much simpler, much straightforward, much more efficient. So you can do this many ways, and I have failed many, many times. So let me show you the latest pig drive. The latest pig drive, I like simple stuff. It's a single axle, and then around the single axle, we're going to put axle half shafts and we put a couple bearings on it. And this is what's called the enclosed axle drive. Each half of the axle can rotate at its own speed or its own direction, or the whole axle can rotate as one piece. It's basically three parts. Now from this, we put axles on it, some wheels, some motors, and these motors are what are called a bias neutral. <clears throat> it's one model of motor that'll fit on either side of the drive system. So we have some drive belts, and there's the complete package, the whole system. Here's the side view. The common center axle is surrounded again by those half shafts, those axle half shafts. So here is the package here. The simple drive for electric vehicle, very efficient, very simple. So in conclusion, the words you've been waiting for. In conclusion, for a lot of today's driving, uh, electric vehicles are fit, fit right in, no problem at all. But they have to appeal to uh, urban drivers making the routine drives, usually in traffic, I see waves of these single passenger cars every morning and every evening going to and from work. The current pricing for the electric vehicles is completely unattractive. The unknown cost surrounding the battery packs and the maintenance makes everybody nervous. Uh, benevolent rich people, taxpayers, cannot make this work. 
good electric vehicles will stand on their own. Uh, so what we see, will the future production electric vehicles become uh, more affordable, simpler, uh, better vehicles? We will see. That is my story, and I am sticking to it. Thank you. You've been a great audience. Now here is the flying pig. Here's the full face. This is the side view. And the annoying hood ornament. Thank you very much.